Hey listeners, this is Ben, the Amateur Exegete, and you're listening to Episode 6 of Bible Study for Amateurs. Today's episode is, The Bible is Old. Apparently, because I was born in the early 80s, I'm a millennial. I can remember a time before cell phones and the internet, when Super Mario Brothers on Nintendo was cutting edge, and when the french fries at McDonald's actually tasted good. It was a different era. If you were to take my 13-year-old and drop her smack dab in the middle of my childhood and ask her to figure out what to do, she might have some difficulty. For starters, the rotary phone in my parents' kitchen would be a complete and total mystery. For another, she would have to find something other than TikTok with which to amuse herself. She might even have to go outside and play with the neighbor kids. Gasp! Last week, we looked at the fourth problem or complexity readers face when trying to understand the Bible per Kristen Swenson in her volume, A Most Peculiar Book. This week, we look at number five. Even the latest of the Bible's texts come from a very long time ago. What this means is that just as I grew up in a different historical context than the one in which my kids are growing up, so too the world that produced the biblical texts is very different from our own. For Swenson, this means that we do well to examine the history behind the biblical texts. It is the quest for clues that might reveal the historical context of any given bit of text, she writes. Let me give you an example of this. Have you ever wondered why in the story of creation found in Genesis chapter 1, Light is created before the sun is? It isn't because the author didn't know that the sun produces light. In fact, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 14, the sun is referred to as a light. Rather, the author apparently thought that the light of the daytime and the light that the sun produced were two distinct lights. You can kind of see why they might think this. When the sun is hidden behind a cloud... Does it suddenly become nighttime? Of course not. And so, daylight and sunlight must be two different things. Additionally, in the narrative of Genesis 1, the light is day and the darkness is night. They aren't caused by the sun or moon. Thus, when it is light outside, it is day, regardless of what the sun is doing. And when it is dark outside, it's night, regardless of what the moon is doing. The ancient Israelite author of Genesis 1 wasn't unique in this understanding of the cosmos. We also find it in Job chapter 38, verse 19, where Yahweh asks Job, Where is the way to the dwelling of light, and where is the place of darkness that you may take it to its territory, and that you may discern the paths to its home? Similarly, in ancient Sumerian creation myth, one that predates the story in Genesis by well over a millennium, depicts light and darkness as themselves causing day and night, irrespective of the sun and moon. Now, we can acknowledge that this view of how day and night work is, per our current scientific knowledge, absolutely wrong, but what knowing this does is to give us a glimpse into how the ancient author thought about his world. He didn't think that the sun was the source of daylight. Instead, he thought that daylight was its own thing altogether. What's important to note here is that providing context helps us appreciate what the text is communicating. Since we aren't ancient Israelites, our assumptions about the world are often very different. Not only that, but what we think we know about the world around us is different as well. Why is the sky blue? Because sunlight hits the atmosphere and is scattered. 
because blue light is of a shorter wavelength, it is more easily scattered, and therefore we see it. But if you were to ask the author of Genesis 1 why the sky is blue, they would have a different answer. Per Genesis chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, above the sky dome, there is an ocean. Again, this is an ancient understanding of the world and should make us appreciate all the more the distance in time between the ancient author and ourselves. That's all the time we've got this week. See you next time. And remember, in the words of Richard Elliott Friedman, one does not need to deny what is troubling about the Bible in order to pay respect to what is heartening. See ya.